Good afternoon. I'm Kenneth Green, the provost here at Fairleigh Dickinson University's College at Florham. And I want to welcome all of you to this afternoon's Public Mind presentation. For the students who have been signing in, you're all set. For those of you who are in here before you signed in, you can sign in what you can sign out, I guess, as, as you leave, leave the room. Uh, so that, that should take care of uh, your, your obligations in terms of signing in. For the past few years, we've enjoyed this series of lectures organized by the public mind. The lectures have informed us as when the candidates for public office have come here and talked about their programs and platforms. Sometimes the lectures have angered us when we learned about the issues of the, around the soprano state. And they have often encouraged us to take action on public policy issues. Today's presentation promises to be one of the most intriguing and enlightening discussion of all in this series. But before we introduce the speaker, I want to thank a few people for their support of the series and the organizing of this event. First, I want to thank Mariah Webb and the library staff for their support, and Colleen DiGregorio especially for doing all of the detailed work that makes these lectures actually work. Thanks to Dean of Students Brian Morrow for his support for the program. And thank you to Catherine Douglas and the, writing college, the college writing program for all of their support in organizing this entire semester. Finally, thanks to Peter Woolley, special thanks to Peter Woolley and the public mind for putting the entire series together. And now we'd like to introduce, introduce Michael Sizer, a political science major and commander of the 490th Air Force, Air Force ROTC Cadet Training Wing, who will introduce our speaker. Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Sizer, a student here at Fairleigh Dickinson University and the Cadet Training Wing Commander of the 490th Air Force ROTC Detachment. It is my pleasure today to introduce you to our guest speaker. Matthew Alexander has served more than 18 years between the active duty Air Force and the Air Force Reserves. He spent much of his time flying helicopters for special operations as a criminal investigator and also serving in the intelligence field. Having been deployed to Bosnia, Kosovo, and Iraq, he's an experienced veteran. He is well known for his book, How to Break a Terrorist, which breaks away from the fear and control aspect which interrogators had followed for many times before. Along with his achievements in Iraq, earning him the Bronze Star, he was involved in over 1,300 interrogations, including those that helped locate terrorist leader Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce a fellow airman Please welcome Matthew Alexander. Let me start off by saying thank you. That was a, a flattering introduction. Uh, and, and thank you to the faculty and to the staff here uh, for inviting me to speak and to share my experiences, uh, and also to all of you for coming to listen. I have one goal that I hope to accomplish today, and that's to educate you about uh, the field of interrogations and about what it means to be a proud professional uh, that calls himself an interrogator. Now, let me see a show of hands just so I know my audience. How many natural born interrogators do we have in the room? Okay. Anybody married? Did you ever ask, what did you do with the remote? <laughs> okay. When I came back from Iraq, I was walking through a Target. And as I went by the toy aisle, there was this young boy there, about yay tall, maybe five years old. He was tugging on his mother's sleeve, and he said, uh, Mom, can I have this Batman? And his mother said, no, you can't. Put that back. And he walked immediately over to his father, tugged on his father's arm, and said, Dad, Mom said I can't have this Batman, but I know you love me more. And that was when I realized that we're all natural born interrogators. Um, some of us more devious than others. Uh, but we all interrogate. Because interrogate is really just about getting information or trying to persuade somebody uh, to change their decisions. I want to paint um, a picture of Iraq for you. Uh, actually, before I do that, 
let me start off also by saying that everything you need to do a good interrogation, you have right here in the room. Um, all of you have a chair, which hopefully is comfortable, because some interrogations run for eight or more hours. Uh, you have a brain, which you need to think, to understand, to come up with theories, to uh, innovate. And you have a heart. And that last part might be the most important, because it's what an interrogator feels uh, and using those feelings, uh, that's one of his most important weapons. I'm going to paint the picture of you of Iraq uh, when I arrived. Uh, I arrived in Iraq in March of 2006. It was exactly one month to the day after this event, which was the bombing of the Golden Dome Mosque in Samara, better known as the al Asqariya Shrine, uh, one of the holiest sites in uh, Shia Islam. Uh, and this bombing was planned and conducted by a man named Abu Masab al-Zarqawi, who was a leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And al-Zarqawi's strategy was quite simple. His idea was that if al-Qaeda, which was made up of Sunnis, would target Shia civilians in Iraq, uh, they could start a civil war between Shia and Sunnis. And by creating that civil war, uh, they could involve American forces in it, bog us down, uh, dramatically increase our number of casualties and thereby turn American public against the war and force our withdrawal, after which he believed his organization, Al-Qaeda, uh, would come to rule Iraq or Mesopotamia. And so this was Zarqawi's strategy. But who was Zarqawi? Who was this man behind uh, the Al-Qaeda leadership in Iraq? Well, Zarqawi was born in Jordan. Uh, and growing up, through his uh, teenage years and young adult years, he was basically a criminal. He had spent time in prison for sexual assault. Uh, at some point, he got out, he went to Afghanistan, he fought in the jihad with the Mujahideen against the Soviets. Uh, and then he returned to Jordan and planned to overthrow the Jordanian government. He was arrested uh, and put back in prison. He became a devout um, follower of an extreme form of Islam, went back to Afghanistan, uh, met Osama bin Laden, who apparently did not like uh, Zarqawi. He thought that he was a thug. Uh, and, but Zarqawi eventually uh, went to Iraq just prior to our invasion and started his own uh, resistance network. Uh, and then later, um, after we invaded, uh, he conducted the bombing of the UN headquarters that you might remember in Baghdad, which convinced Osama bin Laden that he was a valid partner, that he should engage. Uh, and subsequently, he became the key leader, or the leader of Al-Qaeda in all of Mesopotamia. And Zarqawi, um, as many people have said, uh, was not a religious man. Uh, he actually cultivated, um, if anything, uh, his, a strategy of violence. And he was an extremist. And we had been searching for Zarqawi since the initial invasion, having known that he was there prior to, prior to our invasion. And we had hunted him for three years, uh, and not been able to find uh, kill or capture him. And the reason Zarqawi was so important, the leadership of uh, the U.S. forces believed, uh, was because if they could kill Zarqawi, they could slow down the suicide bombings, they could settle the civil war, and allow the Iraqi government to get on its feet, which would uh, solve the war. As we know now, after we killed Zarqawi, the suicide bombings uh, actually increased, uh, and that killing Zarqawi was not the key to the war, um, the Anbar Awakening, or the Sunnis who abandoned Al-Qaeda and decided to work with us in exchange for money and arms was the key to the war. But when we were hunting Zarqawi, we had a very simple strategy, and that was we would go out, we would conduct a raid, we would capture somebody, and we'd try to get them to tell us where their boss was. And then when they told us uh, where their boss was, we would go out and capture that person, and we would do the same thing. And so we were trying to build a series of successes that would go up towards Zarqawi. And along that line, uh, we got information about a house that was being used to supply or to stage suicide bombings. And we saw a meeting taking place there. And we went and raided it. And we captured these five guys. And we brought them back to our prison. There were suicide bombers in the house who we killed. Uh, and back at the prison, we immediately understood that these five guys were important. Just by their education levels, by their speech, by their demeanor, we knew we had captured something big in this group of five people. Now, anybody here seen the movie Silence of the Lambs or the Hannibal movies? There's one guy in this group of five that I'll call Abu Hader, 
who was essentially the Hannibal Lecter of Al-Qaeda. He talked like Anthony Hopkins' character in the movie. He had a British accent. He was very educated. He was very sophisticated. Uh, he was very manipulative. And when he came back to the prison, he was assigned to some interrogators who I call the old school. And this is the situation that I walked into when I got to Iraq. What I found is there was old school interrogators and new school interrogators. And the old school interrogators were the ones that had been in Iraq early on or had been in Afghanistan. And they were the ones that believed that uh, enhanced interrogation techniques were OK. In other words, that it's all right to violate our training, to violate our ethics, if it achieves an end, and that end is to get information that will keep us safe. And so some of the interrogators, uh, now that it was 2006 and we weren't allowed to use enhanced interrogation techniques, were doing everything they could to bend or break the rules. So let me give you an example. So enhanced interrogation techniques outlawed the use of sleep deprivation. And the, when the law went into practice in Taney Treatment Act, it said that we could only interrogate for 20 hours in any one day period. So some interrogators said, well, that's great. Let's give them four hours of sleep, do a 20-hour interrogation. Then we'll reset the day. And we'll start the next day with a 20-hour interrogation. So thereby, we can do a 40-hour interrogation. And this was the types of things that were happening when I arrived in Iraq by some, some group of interrogators. And I thought that was wrong uh, for some very simple reasons that I'm going to go into. But I thought that we should take our interrogations in a different way, which is we should go back to our training, which was based on rapport building, getting to know people, and using the techniques in the Army Field Manual, and also some techniques that we hadn't been taught that I had learned as a criminal investigator. And so I taught my interrogators, uh, and we became what was called the new school of interrogators, the people who didn't believe in using enhanced interrogation techniques, didn't believe in using methods based on fear and control. But the Hannibal Lecter of Al-Qaeda, unfortunately, ended up in the hands of the old school interrogators. And they interrogated him for 20 days. And their approach was simple. Somebody like this, who's so proud of himself, who's so self-confident, can only be made to cooperate through coercion. And the only way to get there is to use fear and control and break down his ego, to make him think that he's less than us, whereby we can control him. And so they tried that for 20 days. Unfortunately, the Hannibal Lecter of Al-Qaeda was a little bit too smart for that. And so he brushed off their approaches as if they were mere children talking to a professor. Uh, and they never impressed on him their knowledge of Iraqi history or the culture, instead insulting him. And he, he never cooperated. And so on the 20th day, they decided, let's get rid of him. He's never going to talk. His basic story was he had come to this house with a video camera to videotape a wedding. And he didn't know there were suicide bombers there. And he never moved off that story. So on the 20th day, they scheduled him to get on a helicopter to be transported to the main prison. Uh, and to be gone. And six hours before that helicopter ride, I decided that I would give it a shot. And so without permission, I took uh, this detainee, Abu Haider, into the interrogation room, and I interrogated him. Now, for the first five hours and 45 minutes, we had a lovely conversation. We talked about all types of serious issues, like um, ultimate fighting championships. Anybody here watch UFC? Okay, see some students. We talked about soccer. Uh, we talked about popular culture. We talked about music. We talked about television. But we also talked about Islam, because I've read the Quran, and so I could ask him questions about his religion. I showed him that I respected it, that I appreciated his, his religion and his faith. Uh, and I impressed him with the fact that I had actually read the Quran, and he was amazed by that. And I'm the only interrogator I've ever met who's read the Quran which is quite amazing, considering that most of our detainees are experts on it. And then, after that, we talked a lot about Iraqi history. Anybody here studied Iraqi history? I should know if there's anybody here. So there's a famous story in Iraqi history. Anybody know who Richard the Lionheart is? OK, Richard Lionheart read the, led the Third Crusade. And his opponent in the Third Crusade was a man named Salah al-Din, who was a Kurd from Iraq. And the famous story in Iraq about Salah al-Din isn't about the defeat of Richard the Lionheart. The famous story is about a battle in which he captures one of Richard the Lionheart's lieutenants, a guy named Guy de Lisson, and he spares his life when he should have killed him. 
And we talk about this. We talk about mercy to one's enemies and compassion towards one's enemies. And at the end of that five hours and 45 minutes, I'd stroked his ego uh, throughout the whole time. I think he came to respect me. And so at the end of it, I gave him a simple proposition. I told him, instead of working for Al-Qaeda, he could work for me. That I had a program I could get him into, that he could work uh, and play a role in the future of Iraq. And that if he would do, it, do that, then I would, I would see to it that he would have this chance. And then I told him that the only way that I would know that he was being faithful to me, that I could trust him, was if he gave me a name. And that he knew the name I was thinking of, and I knew the name he was thinking of, but he would have to say it. Now, I had no particular name in mind. Those of you who play poker, this is called a bluff. But he thought about it for about a minute, which seemed like just about the longest minute of my life. And he looked at me and he said, Abu Ayyub al-Masri, who at the time was the number two guy in Al-Qaeda. Anybody seen the movie The Usual Suspects? This guy was sort of the Kaiser Soche of Al-Qaeda, a guy nobody had ever met, a mysterious ghost of a man who ended up taking Zarqawi's place. And here sitting in front of me was somebody who admitted to meeting him on five occasions. And it was at that point that I realized this is the man who's going to lead us to Zarqawi. This is our opportunity. And so I told him thank you for that information. And I put in, plan, uh, put in place a plan to convince him to keep cooperating with us uh, that ultimately led him to telling us that his best friend was a man named Abu Abdul Rahman, who was Zarqawi's spiritual advisor. And he told us that Abu Abdul Rahman would meet with Zarqawi every month. And that we would know when he was meeting with Zarqawi because he would change from a white car to a blue car. And when that happened, that meant he was going to, to meet with Zarqawi. And so we followed all Rockman. We watched him get from a white car to a blue car. We followed that blue car. And we lost it in Baghdad traffic. <laughs> not, not unlike Manhattan traffic, I imagine. And so we had to go back out and find Al-Rachman again. And on the 7th of June, we found him again. And he went from a white car to a blue car. And he pulled in to a rural safe house. And he went inside. And two F-16s screamed overhead 15 minutes later and dropped two bombs on that house. And we killed Sarkawi, one of the worst mass murders of our generation. And a man who, at the time, was a higher priority than Osama bin Laden on the terror list. What was the weapon that I used? to achieve this success that my team and I used? Anybody venture to give a guess? I think it was compassion. I think it was respect. I think it was rapport building. I think it was a little bit of risk taking. But it had nothing to do with torture. and It had nothing to do with abuse. And in, some people might say, well, this was a revolution in interrogations. That what we did was something new. And what I've said is, it's new, but it's only new for a for since 9-11. Uh, we had interrogators who used these types of methods a long time ago in another war in which we were facing hardcore um, enemies, if you will, dedicated enemies who were willing to be suicide bombers. The only difference is now we've taken those same methods and we've tailored them for a different culture. And that's what makes them new. Because it turns out that in World War II, interrogators used rapport building. They used deception sometimes. But they got to know their enemies, they understood their culture, and then they used uh, that knowledge to convince them to cooperate. Probably the most famous interrogator in World War II was a man up there uh, on the far side of the screen at the top on our tent talking to a Japanese prisoner of war, was Major Shord Moran, who joined the Marines at age 50 after spending a few decades in Japan as a missionary. Uh, and he signed up for the Marines, he went, he was in the initial invasion of Guadalcanal, uh, and he interrogated numerous Japanese prisoners of war and convinced them to cooperate. And he wrote a manual after the war, which became the, the basis for our modern day field manual on interrogations. And in that manual, he specifically said his words, that an interrogator has to be a real wooer. That he needs to woo a detainee to convince him to cooperate. And then we had these men over here who worked at secretive Fort Hunt in Virginia who interrogated people and they did these awful things like they planted um, German Americans into the cells to act as prisoners uh, that they called stool pigeons. They bugged rooms. They played chess with people. In fact, one of their best weapons, it turns out, was cigarettes. 
They exchanged cigarettes for information. And then we had some guys like uh, down here on the far side with the monocle there, Colonel Ten, uh, Robin Tenai Stevens. And Robin Tenai Stevens was a Brit who ran a place called Camp 020 in England uh, where they interrogated, captured Nazi spies, turned them into double agents. A lot of people don't know this, but the success of D-Day can partially be attributed to Colonel Stevens, who convinced Hitler by running double agents that the invasion was going to happen at a different location than it did. And then down here is another famous interrogator, Hans Scharf, who was a German. He interrogated for the German Luftwaffe. And he interrogated Allied pilots. And he never laid a finger on them. He never used abuse. He never used fear and control. He never used coercion. And yet his success rate, as told by our own pilots, was probably around 80 or 90 percent in interrogations. And how did he do that? by using respect and rapport, cunning, deception sometimes. Sometimes he took them to the officer's club and gave them a few drinks, <laughs> but he never used torture and abuse. I want to tell you a story about the, first, the only guy I know in all the interrogations I did that ever gave us every piece of information. His name was Mahmoud, and Mahmoud was in an Al-Qaeda cell in Ramadi, and he was in this cell of, of guys conducting attacks and one day, his cell members suspected that he was a mole, that he was a spy for Americans. And so they grabbed him, and they put him in this warehouse, and they tortured him. They did all kinds of horrible things to him. They burned him. They even did some things that uh, I think would have been considered the same techniques that we used as enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, but eventually, we ended up raiding that same warehouse looking for somebody else and rescued him. And he came back to our prison he sat down in front of me after a doctor had inspected his wounds and treated him, and we'd given him some food. Nobody tortured him, nobody abused him, treated him with respect, and he sat down in front of me, and he said, you know, I've had this all wrong. Al-Qaeda told me that if I was ever captured by Americans, that you would torture me. I've seen the photos of Abu Ghraib. I know what happens at Guantanamo Bay. But you've done none of that. Since I've been here, you've only treated me with respect, you've treated my wounds, You've taken care of me, and now I know that Al Qaeda is a bunch of liars. He told me so much information, my pen literally ran out of ink. I filled up an entire legal pad full of targets. And I think that's what we can accomplish when we leverage the good parts of our culture, our compassion, and our respect for others. I want to ask you does torture work? And then I want to ask you after that question, does it matter? Now I can sit up here, I can stand up here, and I can tell you all these arguments against torture, about the efficacy, about whether or not it works. I won't tell you torture never works, because every technique works on somebody, I guarantee you that. And I guarantee you there's cases of successful uh, interrogations where torture worked. But what does work mean? As I know, because I interrogated in Iraq, and we, I oversaw the interrogation of foreign fighters, the number one reason foreign fighters gave for coming to Iraq to fight was because of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay, the torture and abuse of prisoners. It was al-Qaeda's number one recruiting goal. And those, those statistics were compiled by DOD and briefed to every interrogator in my task force. So if you interrogate somebody, you use torture, and you get information, you stop a terrorist attack, but you recruit 10 more terrorists, is that the definition of, of torture working? And what happens then in future wars when our enemies are going to say, well, we can use torture because it works. We can use it against Americans because it works. So it makes all American soldiers in future conflicts subject to the same techniques. And what does it mean when our allies tell us, as they have, we're not going to do joint operations with you because we don't trust what you're going to do with the prisoners when you capture them? And what does it mean when we go out and fight troops, and as we saw at the end of World War II when we were in Germany and massive uh, parts of the German army defected to the American sides because they knew that they would be treated well. The same thing that we saw in the first Iraq war and the Gulf War when Iraqi units disbanded and fled to our side and surrendered because they knew they would be treated well. What does that mean for future conflicts now that we've used torture? So I ask you, what does it mean when people say torture works? Because you'll never find somebody defending torture from a long-term point of view. It's always it works right here, right now and we got information, it kept us safe. 
but in the long term it doesn't make us safe. And then I could go through all the legal arguments. I could tell you that it's against the Convention Against Torture, which we've signed and ratified and is according to our Constitution, U.S. law. I could tell you that it's against the Uniform Code of Military Justice, that it's against federal torture statute. And I can tell you that that has always been the case until 9-11, and that we've carved out an exception in the law. And that what are we if we're not a country that believes in the rule of law, if we only pay lip service to it? But at the end of the day, I don't care. I don't care if it was legal. I don't care if it worked 100% of the time. Let me ask you, would we use chemical weapons if it saved American lives? We don't. Nobody's going to argue whether or not they're effective. I think they're effective close to 100% of the time. They're illegal. But would we use them? And I think the answer to that is no, because it's immoral. If you went to an infantry troop, let's say a Marine, and you said to that Marine, we're not going to allow you to go do your job the way you've been trained and to go take that hill or that beach because we don't trust you to do it. We don't think you're good enough. The enemy's too, uh, too skilled. And so instead, we're going to use chemical weapons, even though it violates everything that we signed up for. What do you think the Marine would tell you? I think it in involves some four-letter words myself. But they'd be insulted. And that's the way interrogators feel. We don't need a special category of techniques that are outside the law to do our jobs. We're just as capable at doing our jobs without it. And we don't need to use techniques that are against our morals and our values and the principles that we've signed up for. Now, I want to talk just briefly about why people torture. And I, I think there's a dirty word up here on my slide called prejudice. And I say that because in the public, when we have this debate, we talk about fear. Now, how many people here are fearful of this painting on the wall, this young girl? <laughs> You're not, because it's familiar. We're fearful of things that are different. We're fearful of things that we don't understand. And what we've done since 9-11 is we've dehumanized our enemy to make them appear fearful. How many times have you heard the term hardcore terrorist? How many times have you heard the worst of the worst? That these people are so hardcore that they only know violence. They're willing to become suicide bombers. I'm going to stand here and tell you today that the easiest people to interrogate are the hardcore terrorists. Why? Because the hardcore terrorists are the ones that were recruited based on an emotional appeal. They walked into a mosque or they met a recruiter for Al-Qaeda and that person reminded them of the pictures of Abu Ghraib or they talked about um, some other uh, American policy that inflamed their emotions, and then that person decided that this was worth sacrificing their life for. That person comes and gets captured. I can use an emotional approach against him, and the emotional approach is their most effective. It's much harder to interrogate somebody who has a logical reason. Imagine the Sunnis in Iraq that we interrogated who said I joined Al-Qaeda because I needed protection for my family. The Shia militias came to my neighborhood and forced me out of my home. Well, that's a pretty logical argument for joining Al-Qaeda. That's much harder to counter. So the hardcore members I found were the easiest to interrogate. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about another guy in that group of five. Remember I talked about the group of five people that we caught in the house with the suicide bombers that were high-ranking leaders of Al-Qaeda. There was one guy named Abu Beda. And Abu Beda was an older man, maybe 65, very religious imam. And he came into the prison, and some interrogators and analysts got together, and they were trying to come up with a strategy for interrogating this guy, because they knew he was really smart and very religious and be very difficult. And they were sitting down there talking about these strategies, and I said, well, what about using love of family? Does he have any kids? Does he have a wife? And, and people literally laughed at me. They're like, ah, you new guy. What do you know about inter interrogations? These guys, when they join Al-Qaeda, they swear by Yacht, Osama bin Laden, loyalty to death. They're willing to die for this cause. They have sworn off their families. They don't care. And a little voice in the back of my head said, wow, that doesn't really jive with what I learned when I was in Saudi Arabia previously. And another time I spent in the Middle East kind of tells me that, you know, families are very tight-knit groups over here. And it's... I can't imagine that somebody would ever completely swear off their family. So I was laughed at. So they went about these harsh techniques. They went about the fear up techniques, the control techniques. And at the end of the day, one of our analysts is flipping through some papers, and he comes across an old picture of Abu Beda as a young man from some old intelligence report. 
And he realizes that his name's not Abu Beda, it's something else, that he was using a fake name. And he puts that name into a database and he finds out that Abu Beda's son is being held in an Iraqi prison in the south. We call up the prison and they fly Abu Beda's son up to our prison and we take him into the interrogation booth and we put father and son face to face with their masks on and we pull off their masks and Abu Beda takes a look at his son and just breaks down in tears. And after that point, he gave us every piece of information he could. He told us how his operations worked, he was the leader of Al-Qaeda in the north, who his lieutenants were. It was a love of family approach. These people are not robots. They are humans. And just because they join Al-Qaeda doesn't mean they stop being humans. And the best thing that we can leverage against them, against their violence, is our compassion. I want to talk a little bit about leadership because I believe one of the contributing factors to the torture story is a failure of leadership. A failure of senior leaders in the US military and in the uh, civilian administration to stand up and separate themselves from their emotions. We all felt that anger after 9-11. We all felt that rage. Imagine my interrogators. Sometimes we'd go out and raid a house, we'd capture a guy, and in that house we'd get a CD and we'd bring it back and we'd play that CD, and there would be the guy that's sitting in our prison cutting somebody's head off with a machete. Can you imagine walking into that booth to interrogate that guy the way that you feel? Just the, the burning desire for revenge? Yet it was General George C. Marshall in World War II who said, when, when there's war, there's a beast that arises in every fighting man, and it's the obligation of the officers to keep that beast on its chains in himself and in his men. Isn't that what we pay our leaders to do? And that we expect of them is to separate their emotions from their professional duty. And I think there was a failure to do that after 9-11, a failure to separate what we all felt and to carry out our professional duties in accordance with our principles. It was too easy to say that our security was more important than our principles. How many times have you heard politicians say that their first, their first duty or obligation is to protect the American people? I, I challenge you to go out and read the oaths of office of any elected official and find the word security of the American people in there. What it says is we all have an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States of America. I would rather be the size of Kansas and be America than be at our current borders and be Al-Qaeda. And we should never base our principles and our ethics based on our enemy. The last thing uh, I want to talk about is culture and the torture narrative, which was, as I gave some examples of, our inability to understand the culture of our enemy. Now, how many people here know that you never shake with your left hand in the Middle East? How many people know that you don't point the soles of your feet towards somebody? Okay, well, these are all good things to know if you're going to be a tourist. You decide to skip Disney World next year and go to Baghdad, this is going to be very important. Okay. How many people here know what Ramadan is? Okay. How many people have ever heard the term wasta? Wasta means power or influence in Arabic. It's a big cultural value in the Middle East. These are the types of things that we need to know. After 9 11, we were at culture minus 1.0. I mean, not only did we not understand the culture, but we did the exact opposite. You heard quotes, you know, and the highest ranking person that's ever been tried and convicted uh, for torture is a chief warrant officer, and he sent an email to his boss. His boss said, hey, we need to start getting information. People are dying. And he sent an email back that said, well, in that case, we got to use violence because these people only understand violence. It was that type of stereotypical comment that type of prejudice that led to the torture and abuse. And there's definitely a direct link there with misunderstanding the culture, misunderstanding uh, the people, uh, and the willingness to use torture and abuse. Now, the first line of the Quran is, praise be to Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. And that's the line before every chapter in the Quran. That is a theme we can use. Remember the story I told you about Salah al-Din? Those are the types of themes that we can use in interrogations and we should be using, but to know that, we gotta get to culture 3.0. We gotta get beyond just knowing that you don't shake with your left hand. We gotta know the culture so well that we can use it to reinforce our interrogation strategies. 
The other thing we can do is use multidisciplinary approaches. Now let me uh, ask you, how many people here have ever bought a car? Okay. Did anybody ever get to that point in the negotiations over the price with the salesman where the salesman said, you know, I can't give you that extra $300 off or the trim you want or the color or the airbags, but let me call my boss. Did that ever happen? My boss can authorize it. So I'm in Iraq and we capture this guy. He's young. He's 21 years old. His name's Ismael. And he builds Al-Qaeda's websites. They go out, they conduct a suicide bombing, they film it, they give him the footage. He modifies it, put it on a web page, put a bunch of pretty pictures uh, or script up there. So he's their web developer. I guess it's a good job, pays well. And uh, we capture this guy and we're trying to find out who he works for so we can unravel this chain of Al-Qaeda. And he won't tell us. And I assign this young interrogator to him named Marcia. She's probably 20 years old. And together, her and Ismael, every day they're smoking a, two, three packs of cigarettes together. And they got this great rapport going, but at the end of the day, she can't convince him to cooperate. And so she tells him one day, she says, hey, tomorrow my boss is coming here to the prison, and he rarely ever comes here. And he's going to talk to you. And I told him that you're a good guy. So don't mess up this opportunity, because you'll make me lose face. Losing face, big cultural aspect in the Middle East. She says, I could get fired. I can't really get fired, right, from the military? But this is what she tells him. And so, and she uh, goes out of the room and she gets me. And I wore a jacket that day, and I come into the interrogation room, I have a clipboard with a piece of trash paper on it, and I sit down in front of him and I ask him a bunch of questions, what's your name, where are you from? And I get all this data and I put the clipboard down and I said, look, I don't do this very often, but I like you, I think you're an honest kid, I think you're someone we can work with, and I'm gonna make you an offer. You tell me who you worked with, who you worked for, and I'll see what I can do to help you out. And he looks over at Marcia. She has this look on her face of pure compassion, pure comfort. No male interrogator could have ever pulled this off, I can tell you that. And he looks back at me and he says, I worked for Abu Raja. And it turns out Abu Raja was sitting in the booth next to us, getting interrogated. He was one of the members of the group of five who had not given us any information and we couldn't figure out who he was. And that's how we unraveled Al-Qaeda's entire communication strategy in Iraq. It was by using the boss introduction, the same technique that used car salesmen used to get you to buy a car. Now, we have a joke in the interrogator community. What's the difference between an interrogator and a used car salesman? Interrogators have to abide by Geneva Conventions. Right? <laughs> so remember that when you buy a car. There's all these types of all these types of techniques that we can use, uh, that we get from other fields. Anybody ever heard the story about Michael Jordan, that before every game he would picture himself mentally making the winning shot? It's sports psychology, right? Positive mental imagery, reinforcing an act before you do it. So we had this technique in interrogations we called the Van Gogh, based on the Dutch painter. And the idea is you would paint a picture in the Taney's mind that if they cooperated, all these benefits would come from it. And you could paint that picture of the future of Iraq. So I had this other member of the group of five. His name was Abu Gamal. Abu Gamal was 60 years old, white beard. He kind of looked like a mole. He's kind of short, squat. And he came in the interrogation booth, and we started interrogating him, my partner and I. And for three days, he just said, I don't know anything about these suicide bombers or these other guys. I'm a taxi driver. They hailed me off the street. You know, I knew one guy. I think he's my cousin. He told me to drive him to this farmhouse. I drew him there. I had no idea. And he stuck to this story for three days. And I'd gotten to know Abu Gamal a little bit. He told me that he was in the Iraqi army during the Iran-Iraq war. He had been an electrician in the army. He had an electronic store in Baghdad. Wasn't doing so well because of the, the conflict and the drop in the, the economy. He had a son who'd been married for 10 years. No kids, no grandkids. And I decided I need to try this Van Gogh technique, this positive, men mental, imagery, uh, positive mental imagery on Abu Gamal. And so I, one day I walked in and I said, Abu Gamal, close your eyes. Picture this with me. Picture the day you get released from prison. Imagine what it's going to be like to go back home, walk through the front door, and take a look at your wife. Imagine the look on her face, the look in her eyes, when she hasn't known where you've been, 
what's happening to you, and she sees you for the first time. And usually, at this point, I peek up, and I usually see somebody struggling back, and feeling some type of emotion. But Abu Gamal is just staring at me with a blank look on his face. And I said, what's wrong? He said, which wife should I be thinking about? <laughs> so I said, well, how many wives do you have? He was like, I got two. And I said, well, I know about one. Who's the second one? He said, um, well, we just got married last year. I said, how old is she? He said, 19. Now, I know what went through my head because I heard it out here <laughs> when he said that. And so I left the interrogation booth, and my interpreter walked up to me. And he said, hey, Matthew, you know why you married a second wife, right? I said, yeah, I know why. <laughs> and he said, no. Remember he told us his son had been married for 10 years and he didn't have any kids? He married a second wife so he can carry on his bloodline, so he can have another son. This is important in Iraq. That cultural element of the interrogation had gone right over my head. And so I walked back in and I said, Abba Gamal, tell me about your second wife. He said, oh, that girl loves the shop. And she loves the Gucci, she loves the Yves Saint Laurent, and she's Prada. And I was like, oh, my wife's the same way. Man, if I buy her a ruby, she wants an emerald. If I buy her an emerald, she wants a diamond. I'm not married, <laughs> but it sounded good. And so all of a sudden I'm starting to think, here's this guy who has a failing electronic shop. He's got a second wife. And in Islam, if you marry more than one wife, you have to treat each one equally, right? So he's got the second wife, she's spending a lot of money, he's having to keep her up in another apartment. Why do you think he might have joined Al-Qaeda? Money, right? So this is what I'm thinking. Understanding somebody's motivations is the first part to getting them to cooperate. So I'm thinking, this guy joined Al-Qaeda for money. So I go back to the office, I have a safe, we have $10,000 cash in it that we confiscated in a raid. I take out the money, I put it on my desk, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to throw the $10,000 down on the table, and I'm going to say, Al Gamal, work with me. And as I'm sitting there, there's two analysts in the corner, and they're talking about having a conversation, and I hear them, and one says, hey, did you read the paper today? In the Iraqi paper, it says that you can now legally get a divorce in Iraq. Under Saddam, you couldn't do this. And all of a sudden, a light bulb goes off in my head. What does Abu Gamal really want? What's he motivated by? Is it money? It's not. It's honor. If you're going to marry a second wife under Islam, you have, to prepare, you have to support her the same level that you do your first wife. And to not do that is dishonorable. And you would lose respect with everybody that knows you. So it's not money that Abu Gamal wants. It's honor. It's respect. So I get on my computer, and I get on Google, and I type in divorce application Arabic, and I get one from Jordan, and I change the label on it to be from Iraq. And I go over it with my interpreter, and I walk in an interrogation booth, and I sit down in front of Abu Gamal, and I say, Abu Gamal, today I'm going to make you happier than the king of Saudi Arabia. And he looks at me kind of puzzled, and I pull out the divorce application, and I hand it to him, and he looks it up and down, reads it over twice, and he looks at me, and he says, can I fill this out now? <laughs> like, sure, I hand him my pen. And when he gets done, he says, thank you. Thank you so much. And he says, I wire vests, suicide vests for Al-Qaeda. $50 each. And he'd wired hundreds of vests all over Iraq. Remember I talked about he was an electrician in the army? He's an electronics store. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? He'd been wiring vests for Al-Qaeda, and he told us the locations of all the places where he'd wired vests, and we went out and we took out a big portion of Al-Qaeda's suicide bombing network for a month. And it was compassion. It was compassion that convinced Abu Beda, or uh, Abu Gamal to cooperate. It wasn't torture. People come up to me, or uh, let, me, let me say this. How many people do we have in here? I see a lot of students under the age of 25. Okay. How many of you have access to what my father calls the interwebs, better known as the internet? I think the next generation of Americans are the perfect raw material from which to uh, mold interrogators, and for three reasons. The first is because of the internet and globalization, 
Remember I asked how many people know about Ramadan? I think if we'd asked that same question 50 years ago, we wouldn't have had the same response. But globalization and the internet has made our global community much closer. We've come to understand other cultures that are different than ours. And I think younger generations are more in tune in that now than they ever have been. So I think the internet has helped. And the second thing is, how many people in here have Facebook? Don't lie. OK. I'm an interrogator, so I'll know if you're lying. <laughs> Al-Qaeda is organized like Facebook. There's no Al-Qaeda recruiting office. You don't go down and sign a contract for four years to get the Al-Qaeda GI Bill. It's organized like Facebook, and it's based on social networking. It's like, hey, I have a cousin, and my cousin can get arms. But he's on his way to Ramadi, so while he's over there, tell him to drop off some money, pick up some foreign fighters, and uh, stop by the market and get some tomatoes. It's based on social networking. It's based on who you know, families, tribes, relations. And I think younger generations get that endemically because, because of uh, Facebook. Now, last thing, how many people watch reality TV? I don't know why, but so every time fewer people admit watching reality TV than Facebook. Remember that episode of um, The New World where somebody cried? Right. It's every episode. <laughs> The point I'm making is that younger generations understand emotions. Boy, do they understand emotions. And my young interrogators, boy, do they understand how to manipulate emotions. In the interrogation booth, interrogations, uh, emotions rage like wildfires. It's a naturally emotional activity to interrogate somebody with, where lives hang in the balance. And young people understand that. They grew up in this culture where emotions rage. And they know how to use those. They're not afraid to talk about them. And so I think, because of that, they make great interrogators. People come up to me sometimes after these lectures and they say, hey, Matthew, thanks for being on the front lines of this war. And I tell them, I'm not on the front lines of this war. I'm on the back line. I'm necessary as an interrogator because everything else we've tried has failed. By the time somebody decides to become a terrorist, gets equipped, plans an attack, and goes to carry it out, and we capture them in somewhere in that process, before or after, and we interrogate them to get information, we've already lost at the front lines. We're now in prevention mode. Anybody here read the book Three Cups of Tea by Greg Mortensen about building schools in rural Pakistan and Afghanistan, primarily uh, girls' schools? That's the front lines of this war. The war we have to win is the war, as we like to say, of hearts and minds. This war will never end by us stopping terrorist attacks. I guarantee you, in none of our lifetimes, will there be zero members of Al-Qaeda. There weren't before 9-11, and there won't be any time soon. The difference, winning in this war, will be when we turn the corner from Al-Qaeda being able to increase the number of people it can recruit to where it decreases. And things like torture and abuse have only served to help Al-Qaeda recruit new fighters. And everything we do, whether it's detention policy, whether we're talking about drone strikes, whether we're talking about interrogations, has to be focused on one aim, and that is denying Al-Qaeda new recruits. Now, will that number ever be zero? No. But you know, there's an old story, a history lesson from the Philippines, where they had a communist insurgency um, 50 or so years ago. And that insurgency was solved through social and economic solutions through incentive programs to draw people back out of uncertainty into government programs where they'd have jobs and get paid. And at the end of the day, has anybody here ever read about communist Philippine terrorist attacks lately? Yet there's still 3,000 members of the Philippine communist movement. Why do you not read about it? Why do we not talk about it? Because it's handled by local law enforcement. And because there is a dwindling, dying breed. And that's where we need to get to in this war. And I'm confident, I'm very confident that we can get there, that we have the tools available to us to achieve this objective. But it's going to take doing all those things I talked about, about applying our knowledge of culture. I told my interrogators that the same things that make you a great American are the same things that will make you a great interrogator. You can leverage your compassion. You can leverage your cultural understanding. You can leverage your ingenuity and you can leverage your brain and your heart. And that's what will help us win the war. Thank you.
thank you for coming out again. Um, I know I appreciate it. I'm sure the rest of everybody here, especially the college students, it's a, not a perspective we get to see every day. So uh, we thank you again. One more round of applause, please. I'll be facilitating uh, questions and answers along with Mike in the back. I'll handle the front half and Mike will handle the back half. Um, so any questions we have, just raise your hand and I'll come around and we'll take it from there. Uh, however, since I have the mic, I have the pleasure of asking the first question, so I'll go from there. Um, what I'm curious is where you and your interrogating team um, have started your, you know, what you call the new age of interrogating, where you use compassion and not so much torture as a means of interrogating. How many, what's the future of interrogating look like? Are a lot more interrogators taking that on as something that they look at? I mean, is there more of an American ignorance where they still think, oh, we need the torture to get answers? And I'm sure there's people that are out there who are still thinking that, you know, even though we have the results that we've seen that you and your team have accomplished, um, where's the future of interrogating leading? I'm, I'm optimistic because I, you know, we had the executive order when Obama took office on a second day, uh, banning torture and restricting us to the Army Field Manual. And on, on that note, I'm, I'm optimistic because I think we've turned the corner on torture uh, in this administration. Uh, I think now, though, however, it's become a policy discussion about whether or not it's policy to torture, not whether or not it's against the law or immoral. And I'm concerned that in a future administration uh, or after another future if we have another terrorist attack, that some people will see this uh, as being an option for going back to. Uh, I think none of us should be surprised that terrorism is around to stay. You know, recently, President Obama came under some criticism for saying that we had the ability to withstand terrorist attack, and some people accused him of being soft uh, in saying that we would accept one. Nobody accepts a terrorist attack, but terrorism didn't start on 9-11. And for anybody in the military, you know, we've had been dealing with terrorist attacks. We had Beirut bombing, USS Cole, Cobra Towers. We all accept that it's a, it's a good possibility. I think we've turned the, the corner on torture as a matter of policy, but we haven't turned it on a matter of morality. And to do that, I think what we need um, is a truth commission. I think we need a commission that would look and expose all the facts about torture and have some type of accountability. And by accountability, I'm not talking necessarily about prosecutions. Uh, I'm not talking about putting people on trial or putting them in prison. The things that I would most like to see, however, is I would like to see the American government acknowledge that torture was wrong, was against the law, and is against our morals. And I would like to see reparations paid to those people who were tortured. And I think that type of activity would show, be the minimum to show that we don't endorse torture and we won't go back to it. There's still some interrogators who do believe we should be allowed to abuse prisoners. Um, they're a small minority, I think, at this point. And I also do still think there's, and we still hear this from senior leaders, retired military and others, who say that it was okay to torture people. Um, former President Bush recently said that he ordered the waterboarding of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and he'd do it again, which I think is also an admission that he would help al-Qaeda to recruit because we know that al-Qaeda recruited based on our policy of torture. So I think we've turned the corner from a policy perspective, but we haven't turned the corner on the morality of the issue. And until we have that uh, public uh, commission inventing of this whole episode and acknowledge that it wasn't just a mistake but a crime, uh, that we can't move forward. Hi, my name is Dan Landau. Uh, I got a question for you. Putting aside any, uh, any sort of moral aspect of this, say you're not getting information by using the, your compassionate, respectful methods. Why not torture then? <laughs> you can't put aside the moral issues. Um, if you're making the argument that it's just another tool in the toolbox that we can use, then I would ask you again, why don't our infantry soldiers use chemical weapons? Why don't we still use flamethrowers? Why do we not allow, why do we try to reduce civilian casualties when we do targeting decisions? We do all these things because we think it's moral. So you can't separate 
the argument against torture. Um, I can go through a lot of reasons why torture doesn't work in the short term. I can tell you that just watching harsh interrogation techniques, I never saw them work. And I can tell you that uh, it always set us backwards, that it reaffirmed in the mind of the detainee why they were fighting against us. And the experiences of our own prisoners of war would tell us the same thing. You know, we know from Vietnam and Korea and World War II that our prisoners who were tortured became more resolved to resist. But I think you can't separate the efficacy argument from the moral argument because I'm not going to, I'll, I'll be, I'm not going to be the person to tell you torture never works. It'll work on somebody. I know somebody who told me a story about it working and regrets it terribly uh, because he realized that even though it worked, he sold out the very cause he was fighting for. Okay. Um, I, I very much appreciated your points about compassion and um, I thoroughly agree with you. Uh, I wanted to know what your uh, ideas are on the current trial that's going on and um, I, I wanted to know what your ideas are on Which that. trial? The, the trial that's going on in New York right now, I think it is. Um, Times Square bombing. Okay, Faisal Shazad. Right, because okay. um, there, there's, some, there's some thought behind that and also um, what the, the mechanisms are behind that mm -hmm. and also um, what are, are some of your ideas behind um, what we should pursue in our current policies? Because I have some friends who are really concerned about how we should move forward mm -hmm. with terrorism policy. Right. Um, they think we should be more aggressive mm -hmm. and how we should possibly, you know, we shouldn't Mirandize people on the battlefield, in other words. Right. And, and this is really, you know, we should pursue a more aggressive policy. Yeah, let me, let me say that. We shouldn't on, be too kind, in other words. Right. right. I always, always get accused of being too soft, right. too kind to these bad guys. Right. But at the end of the day, I'm getting information, and I'm going out, and I'm ca killing or capturing somebody who's intending us harm. So I, 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 uh, I don't think that's so kind at the end of the day. Kindness or compassion is an end to a mean, which is to go out and stop terrorists from attacking us. The question, though, I would ask people who want harsher policies or who believe we're being too kind is, well, how long do you want to keep killing terrorists? We can play terrorist whack-a-mole for the next hundred years. They can recruit people as they've proven from anywhere, even here in the United States. They've proven they can recruit from Yemen, from Africa, from Afghanistan, from everywhere. The question is, how long do we want to keep having to defend ourselves from terrorist attacks, and how often? We're never going to get the number to zero. There's always going to be a Faisal Shazad. I guarantee it. I guarantee you that as long as Israel and Palestine are in conflict, there will always be terrorists. Guarantee it. The question is, do we want one or do we want 10? Or do we want 100? And if we want to limit that number to the minimum amount possible, then our national security policy has to be aimed at stopping terrorist recruitment, not at stopping terrorist attacks. And being harsh to people, harsh to me is, it's a nonsense word. As an interrogator, I don't even know what harsh is supposed to mean. I only know about effective interrogations and ineffective interrogations and lawful and principled interrogations. I don't know about harsh. I've put people through interrogations that were legal, ethical, moral, that somebody might say was harsh because it was emotionally difficult, but it was a legal and ethical interrogation that wasn't torture or abuse. If you get arrested down here uh, and you get accused of murder, that you didn't do, and the police take you down to the, to the um, prison or the jail, and they interrogate you, I guarantee you it's going to be emotionally what some people might call harsh. That doesn't mean it needs to be unlawful, illegal, unethical, or immoral. So harsh is uh, this word that I believe is just a euphemism we've come up for because we don't want to say the word torture or abuse. And remember, the standard for interrogations isn't torture. The standard's always been cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment which is a much uh, lower standard. And that's what the Army regulation says. Uh, and so when we got to the point of torture, we were so far beyond what our standard was. But I think people who say we need to be more aggressive and we don't need to Mirandize people on the battlefield, first of all, you have to ask them, what is the battlefield? Because we've defined the battlefield as the war of terror as the entire globe. And if, if that's the case, then we have a lot of questions to answer. You know. 
about targeting of American citizens, about due process, about where we try people for civilian courts versus military courts. But at the end of the day, I keep coming back to this idea. And that's that we can't win this war by stopping terrorists. We can only win it by stopping terrorist recruitment. Um, hi. Um, so I understand that the first path that should be taken is the compassionate path. But at the end of the day, when you can't break that person, aren't there certain types of, types of torture that aren't unethical that you could use at the end of the day when nothing else is working? No, there aren't certain types of torture that are ethical that we could use. Every type of torture is exactly that. And people want to talk about torture that doesn't leave marks, you know, whether it's sleep deprivation or solitary, extended solitary confinement. But I, I want to ask this. For any technique that we're willing to use on our enemies, we have to be willing to accept it if it's used on our own people. And there are some gray areas. I won't say there aren't gray areas in interrogations of methods that we have to debate and discuss whether or not it's ethical. But they're so far beyond what we're talking about, torture and abuse. The rule that I always used was the golden rule. And that's the one standard I can tell you that we should always come back to is, if this was one of our troops and it was being used against them, would we consider it torture? And the example that I'll give you is, right now in the Army Field Manual, in the Appendix M, you're allowed to keep somebody in solitary confinement for an indefinite time period with four hours of sleep a night. Now, would anybody, was anybody going to doubt that it would be torture to be left in solitary confinement for 10 years with four hours of sleep a night? You can still torture and abuse people legally right now under the current system. The question becomes who determines where that limit is. And I don't think it should be interrogators. Would I be comfortable with one of my troops being captured by the enemy, being put into solitary confinement for a month, two weeks, three days? What would be the right amount? Well, I can tell you that I do believe that solitary confinement should be legally allowed and isn't torture it right after the point of capture because we do that here. If they kept two people down here stealing a television, I guarantee you they're going to bring them back and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk and collaborate. How long that goes on for, I think, and where it crosses a line between um, being ethical and into abuse or torture should be determined by medical professionals. Now, some medical professionals have said we don't want to do that because we don't want to be involved in uh, anything that might be construed as giving approval for torture or abuse. But somebody has to determine where that limit is. And right now, it's, it's, uh, it's lawyers. When you're, in, when you're in a war and you have a question over technique, you turn to a lawyer and you say, it would be okay to do this. And they say, yeah, it's legal or it's not legal. But who's going to say whether or not it's moral? And that responsibility is always going to be on the senior interrogator, the person in charge of the interrogators. And they're always going to have to make some tough calls. And I think the best rule they can always rely on is to go back to the golden rule. Hi, my uh, question is, in terms of acknowledging and prosecuting those Americans that have uh, used uh, practice torture, couldn't, you know, just by acknowledging that we have tortured, couldn't that become potentially a recruitment tool for groups like Al-Qaeda to, you know, gather more members? Isn't that uh, a potential threat that our government faces by, you know, prosecuting uh, those that have practiced torture? It, no doubt will be a consequence. Um, just like, you know, the government decided not to release the 100 plus additional photos of abuse um, that they have, which I'm told by sources are worse than the Abu Ghraib photos in some cases. Uh, and we've decided to do these things because we say that it would help, it would inflame the enemies, it would result in the deaths of U.S. soldiers. But I think that's taken the attention off the issue, which is that uh, I, I can tell you exactly what the sentiment is in the Middle East. Um, and in those vulnerable populations, the ones that we're trying to keep from being recruited, when they hear that is, there go the Americans again, they're hypocrites. They tell the rest of the world, don't torture, hold people accountable, but they won't do it themselves. So that helps Al-Qaeda recruit also. And that's exactly what Osama bin Laden has said in his messages, is, Al is America is a bunch of hypocrites. So I think not doing it helps them recruit as much as helping them uh, or doing the, the accountability helps them to recruit. I don't want to see the trials of interrogators. I'm not for that. I'm not for criminally trying the interrogators for torture. Um, I don't believe in just saying it. it's, it's in the past and we do nothing. 
I, again, I'm not, I don't want to see us, like some people have said, I don't want to see us to get into this cycle where each administration prosecutes the previous one um, for crimes. What I do want to see is a public acknowledgement by the government that this was a crime and then reparations paid to the victims. And I think that would take the air out of Al-Qaeda's argument that we're hypocrites. I'm trying to figure out whether the story you relate, the account you relate, is a, a discouraging or an encouraging story with respect to, I guess, military culture and policy adaptation. The encouraging thread might be a policy shifted over time, not that didn't take that long for, for this transition to occur, and uh, military superiors listen to a new generation of interrogators. I guess the discouraging account or, or uh, thread in the narrative is that it did take some time. Uh, it sounds like mistakes were made. Intelligence probably squandered, or at least intelligence opportunities were squandered. And the system that you've described at times is sort of anti-empirical, you know, not, not, not that responsive to results always and driven by uh, passion as much as reason in many cases. So, you know, how do you see it? Was this an encouraging or discouraging picture with respect to how policy gets made? And do you think we've kind of closed that door and the future will be a more sort of responsible and, and rational one? Um, you have stories, you know, I'm not the first interrogator to say no to torture. Uh, back in 2004, General Mattis, who's now in charge of Central Command, CENTCOM, took General Petraeus's place, um, was in charge of an entire task force in Iraq. Um, and when he, his intelligence officers were given the approval from uh, Secretary Rumsfeld to use enhanced interrogation techniques, um, together they rejected them. And General Mattis forbid his entire task force from using enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, a friend of mine, Colonel Steve Kleinman, who's been an interrogator for 25 plus years, intelligence officer, um, was in Iraq. He was one of the Siri instructors, you know, survival instructors that was sent there to uh, teach interrogators how to use the techniques that we use to train our troops to resist torture, to teach those techniques to interrogators to torture prisoners. And he was given a direct order from a general officer to, to teach the interrogators to use these techniques, and he refused it, saying it was an unlawful order. So there are, all, there are encouraging stories of soldiers, of leaders, uh, saying no uh, to the torture and abuse of soldiers, but I don't think there were enough. And I think until we have a public acknowledgement again within the military, which would be part of a broader um, commission, uh, that these were crimes, not mistakes, not policy differences, that we can't move forward. And I think we all suffer from a leadership perspective from, from the acceptance of those decisions. Uh, and I, th I think other people have said, uh, I know the former dean of West Point has said this, um, that the military needs to come to grips with the leadership failures that happened that led to torture and abuse. And until we do that, we can't move forward. Hi. Um, how, do, how do you think that we lost our compassionate interrogation techniques between World War II and now? And what can we do to prevent the loss again? Well, I think the reasons that I put up here are the reasons why we changed. It was because of prejudice. It was because of the inability to separate our emotions from our professional duty and leadership failures. It's what my friend Stu Harrington, Colonel Harrington, was a, a very effective interrogator in the Vietnamese War, um, in the Vietnam War, and he best described it as a perfect storm of events. You know, between the legal rationing for it, the inability of leaders to stand up and recognize that this would have long-term negative effects on the U.S., um, to the moral decision to do this, uh, they were all contributing factors. Um, for me, I always saw this direct relation between the people in Iraq who wanted to use derogatory terms towards our enemies like towelhead or raghead, um, and those people who wanted to use harsh techniques. You, know, you saw that prejudice go over into dehumanization, go into abuse. And, and ironically, that's exactly what they taught us and our training is not to do that because that's what would happen. They told us, don't use these terms because they dehumanize people, and if you start doing that, you're going to quit seeing as human and it's going to make abuse that much easier. And, I, and, and as soon as we got to Iraq, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people were using those terms. And one of the books that everybody was reading when I was going through training was The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam. And it's a book they were reading to understand uh, the culture. You know, and, and I suggest to people, well, what, what about read Karen Armstrong's Islam? 
Or what about pick up and read the Quran? You know? Um, but this was the mentality, and I think until we, we address that and we overcome that, and you see it coming up again with the Park 51 uh, recreational facility in New York at, at ground zero, the same types of arguments and language. You know, uh, I'll pick one out. <laughs> Why not? Glenn Beck said, I read this quote recently, he said, how can they build a mosque in the same place where they attacked us? They're spitting in our face. Is that type of rhetoric? He, he is directly saying that the people who attacked us on 9-11 are the same as the people who are building the mosque? He has no ability to separate out the extremists in Al-Qaeda from moderate Muslims. And that's the type of prejudicial statements that are fueling Al-Qaeda. You know, you know what Al-Qaeda is? Al-Qaeda is a cult. And some people would argue, and I think correctly, that Al-Qaeda is not even, that members of Al-Qaeda are not even Muslims because they're attempting to add two tenets to the religion that don't exist. One is the killing of other Muslims, which is not a tenet of Islam, and the second is the idea of perpetual violent jihad. And by doing that, they have desecrated the religion. And I think most moderate, uh, almost all moderate Muslims would agree with that, that Al-Qaeda is not representative of the Muslim faith and that they're not even Muslims. They're a cult. It's like saying David Koresh is representative of Christians. And until we get over that type of language, I think uh, we're going to be fighting this war for a long time. That's all the time we have for today. So once again, I want to thank Mr. Alexander for coming out.